Welcome to Inside the War Room. Ryan Ray here, as always, and a special co-host today, um, Ben Samuels. We'll get to Ben in a second. Uh, the reason is is because the guest, as you saw, was Carol Baskin. And so Ben, being the friend that he is, got me this autographed Carol Baskin card for my birthday last July. And so if he wants to be birthday gifts, we could talk about that. So I thought, you know, how do you return the favor to a good friend like that other than letting him sit co-host for the podcast where you interview the legend herself, Carol Baskin. Ben, we just got through recording. Uh, obviously, we're not going to do all spoilers, but man, what was your takeaway from this podcast? Well, first, I want to point out that uh, I was giving you uh, crap on one of the previous podcasts for um, on you know not giving me a birthday present for the last few years. I will tell you that bringing me on to this podcast as a co-host absolves you not only of, of that, you don't need to worry about that for the next like 50 years. So we're, we're, we're good. Very much appreciated. Um, you know, I th so first off, I just I thought she was a fantastic guest. I thought she was incredibly gracious. I, I thought she had well informed answers. I, I thought she, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I really enjoyed the time. What about you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I, I sent you a, a text here, and like she's a great guest, and that's the thing when you see Tiger King and you kind of hear her talking outside of Tiger King. It's two different people almost, right? From what the show mm -hmm. portrayed to what you you got on the podcast today, and um. The one thing I didn't get to ask her was just is how small the circle of the Tiger Kingdom people is because she knows so much about it. I wonder if it's a, you know, it, you could see it being very small, but you can also see it having all these little dark alleys that is kind of hard to track. So I was curious about that. But, you know, you brought up some random case at some point. She's like, yeah, that was back in 2011 and knew all about that. She was extremely, extremely knowledgeable. Um, and I'm not saying that like I didn't think her to be, but it was, you know, you've done enough of these, you know, you start asking questions. There is no script here. We're just asking questions that will um, sometimes the guests don't have good answers, and she seemed to have good answers for all of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, th I thought she, um, you know, she's clearly, I guess, been on the circuit for for a little while now, and and done a number of these. But uh, you know, her her ability to sort of, you know, point the point the information in the right direction in the sense of you know having the talking points for the big cats, and, and you know having sort of the understanding of. Um, you know, so one of the things that she talked about that I had no idea about that I thought was incredibly impactful was just simply the difference between a sanctuary and a zoo and private ownership and public ownership. And she talked really about a lot of those things that unless you, you know, to your point, unless you're like in the cat business, you're not going to know. But I wow. thought were incredibly impactful and, and really helped uh, kind of inform the conversation. Yeah. The, yeah. So I need to watch Tiger King again, kind of with that lens, kind of understanding. Um, now, that's presuming that they labeled all of the things that she did maybe they did maybe they didn't but at least better understand the business the other thing that she said and i didn't i didn't want to get into it too much because i didn't want to get too distracted she said that the Irwins are kind of part of the problem with this you know if you caught that or not with the documentary that's coming out mm -hmm. uh, and that was a pretty interesting claim i wanted to get into it just it, it seemed to deviate too far and i didn't want to um i didn't want to spend too much time there but uh i thought that was an interesting claim because i've never heard that before i've always heard they're big contributionists so i was kind of surprised by that so I think it comes from, or at least the way I, I read into that, because you're right, I thought that was interesting as well, is that, you know, on the show uh, that, that Steve Irwin had, you know, it was very, very touch oriented, right? And so you're sort of teaching that, oh, you can go up and touch these these animals. And, and, and her point and kind of the ethos that she was talking about is that very much not. I mean, you're supposed to have a healthy respect for the animals, but but not supposed to be picking them up and, and taking them you know, home as pets. And, and so I think that, you know, those other shows may sort of just give off the, the wrong messaging. Yeah, but, but she said, and I can listen to the tape, make sure I heard it right. I think she said that the, that the Irwins and these other groups, they don't have the animals. They need these people to be breeding them so that they can import them into their uh, mm -hmm. conservation area. So anyways, uh, that was it. Okay. Um, oddly enough, you're the next guest for the show, so I will be doing this segment next time without you talking about you. So can, can I be on? Can I be on that one too? The pre the pre part? No, you can't. You can't be on that. I'll I will judge you after you come on the show. And the the worst part is is you're following the Carol Baskin episode. So like, <laughs> yeah, I, I see why I, I see why you scheduled it for the day that you did. So that's so there's something you know. You know. Touche. Okay. Well played. Well played. <laughs> okay, so two quick things here, and we'll get you to Carol Baskin, which is why you're here. First off, Ryan recommends segment of the day. Ben will recommend this too. Never split the difference by Chris Voss. I've gone through this four or five times. It's fantastic. I love it. Ben, I know you've read it a bunch, maybe more than that. Co Cosign, yeah, a number of yeah, times. Great, great book. So link to it below in the show notes. And our sponsor, again, is Bluehost, RyanRaySenior.com slash hosting. 
two ninety five for your hosting. Ben's got like a million websites. I don't know if he's got with Bluehost or not. All mine are with Bluehost because that's the, where, where you want to be. We won't ask Ben where his rep because that's not who's sponsoring this podcast. Bluehost is sponsoring it. I'm smarter than Ben. Therefore, you go with Bluehost. Thank you, Ben, for acknowledging that. Okay, Carol Baskin, obviously, you know her from Tiger King. She is a big cat conservationist. Um, we will link to all of the things that you can find her and find her work at, so be sure to check that out. And they have all kinds of cool videos and stuff on their website, so be sure to check that out. Um, without further ado, the great Carol Baskin. Carol, it's lovely to have you on the program. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Okay, so this is a little bit of a all we're um, uh, starstruck moment here for, for Ben and I as we've been huge fans of you and uh, since Tiger King and all that. And so, um, you know, it's, it's funny. I've interviewed a lot of people. Uh, this episode, I think, has gotten more people excited. I was telling Ben, I was dropping the kids off at school the other day, and some guy didn't even know. He goes, how'd it go with Carol? I'm like, who, who are you? <laughs> I didn't even know who he was. And so um, you are in the great state of Texas, a celebrity in your own right. So um but let's start with the cats. What got you interested into big cats, cats in general? Um, was it small cats, then big cats, or what got you into the cat game? The very first photo of me as a child, I am in a cradle with a cat, a domestic cat. And when I was about eight years old, I discovered that domestic cats were being killed in shelters due to overpopulation. And I vowed to make that my life's mission would, would be to end that killing of these healthy cats and kittens. And then I, when I was... I left home at the age of 15, and by the time I was 17, I think, I was doing rehab and release for native bobcats who have been hit by cars or shot by hunters. If they are born in the wild, you can release them back to the wild. So that's still my favorite part of what I do. In fact, I was working all morning on a rescue. And then when I was in my 30s, I was at an auction, and we were buying llamas, and a guy came in with a bobcat for sale. And his wife didn't want the cat anymore because she was six months old and had grown up to be a bobcat. And the guy next to me was bidding on her. And I leaned over and I said, when that cat grows up, she's going to tear your face off. And he said he was a taxidermist and that he was going to club her in the head in the parking lot and make a den decoration out of her. And so I started crying and my husband started bidding on that bobcat. And we probably paid more for Winsong than anybody's ever paid for a bobcat before, but she was not going to get killed that day. And then that led us to rescuing a friend for her, turned out to be a fur farm. So we came home with 56 bobcats and lynx. And then the next year we went back and got all of the adults. And that was another 28 bobcats and lynx. And then the following year, we bought out the last fur farm in the U.S. with 22 bobcats and lynx. And so by 1994 or five, by then, we had over 200 cats and people started calling and saying, hey, would you take my lion? Would you take my tiger? And I'm thinking, what on earth are people doing with lions and tigers? And so I stupidly thought at each juncture, how hard could this be to fix? <laughs> I thought I could do it pretty quickly. Turns out I'm 30 years into it and still trying to fix it, but I think we're getting close. So you mentioned the bobcats there. The only real experience I have, uh, I used to live in Louisiana, and I think you could shoot one bobcat a year. So every now and then you come across one person who would shoot a bobcat. The general per perception is they're kind of dangerous, as you mentioned, um, kind of a pest more than anything. Maybe dispel some of the myths around bobcats for us. Well, they're a lot smaller than what most people think. And I'm always surprised when people call me, they'll tell me that there's a hundred pound cat in their yard and they send me a picture and it's like, it's a 20 pound bobcat. <laughs> but they are really vicious. They are just, they're not afraid of anybody and they will scare you to death with the screaming noises they can make at you as they're trying to call your bluff. So I think people are a lot more terrified of them than they need to be. But the biggest issue is that people don't understand that these apex predators are so important to the ecosystem. Wherever you have people, you have trash. And wherever you have trash, you have rats. And where you have rats, you have rabies and all kinds of disease-borne, um, all kinds of um, disease vectors. And so the bobcats, and in Texas, it would be the cougars here in Florida, the Florida panthers, are the top level apex predators that keep everything in the ecosystem underneath them in balance. And when you remove them from the wild, then you create a overpopulation of rats or in some cases even deer where people, I think there are way more people that get killed by deer each year running out in front of their cars than by 
cougars or Florida panthers or any of the big cats that are in the U.S. So, Carol, I'm curious, against that backdrop, I think I am on uh, Tiger King or may have read somewhere that in the wild, uh, you know, the, the average, and I believe it was talking about tigers um, for that data point, but uh, was talking about sort of territory that the average is some 400 square miles. Um, you, know, you, you obviously have been very involved on the captivity side um, of, of the, the cat ecosystem, to your point. Can you t- uh, tell us some of the, uh, you know, again, going back to dispelling some of the myths maybe around captivity and what are some of the benefits of that? And, and what, what have you seen um, you know, in your time in the industry and in, in the business uh, you know, of, of cat, or, you know, with the cats that really has provided a benefit as to some of maybe some of the other you know, sides that people may be more familiar with or maybe talked about in the media? I'm glad you brought that up because tigers in the wild usually roam anywhere from 100 square miles to 400 square miles, depending on their territory and the availability of prey. And so people look at a 500 pound or even a 300 pound tiger and think, well, that cat needs a lot more room than what we could provide in captivity. But a bobcat only being a 20 pound cat, we had one that had been, she'd been hit by a car and then hit again and maybe hit twice. I forget this cat was really beat up when she came in. I mean, all kinds of broken bones and she had been through rehab in our hospital. And then she went out to our rehab cages, which are over 5,000 square feet so that she can build up her muscles and start learning to hunt and take care of herself again before we turn her loose. And the first day that I put her outside into that big enclosure, I watched her on a surveillance camera because we try to keep them as wild as possible with very little human interaction. And she traveled 16 miles in a single night. And this is a bobcat who had just been completely smashed by cars within the previous couple of months. And already she was roaming 16 miles in a single night. And so there's just no way that any of us can give these cats any kind of a experience that's even close to what they experience in the wild as far as their freedom goes. And they're so intelligent. All of these big cat species are just amazing animals. You know, it's so easy for them to problem solve and figure out where your weak points are and always be watching you for some screw up that you're going to make and, you know, how you house them, how you contain them or how close you get to them. (laughs) And they're always looking for that opportunity to free themselves. And so it's been abundantly clear to me that these cats just do not belong in cages and we should be doing everything that we can to ensure their survival in the wild. And that starts by eliminating the captivity of these animals. And most of these cats, if you guys saw Tiger King, it sounds like most of these cats that end up in cages are bred for a a four week window from the time that they're about eight weeks old until they're 12 weeks old, that they are very lucrative for cub petting. And then as soon as they get to be 12 to 16 weeks old, they can take a finger off a child and all of a sudden they're a huge liability. And that's when they dump them into private hands or kill them. And so if we can stop the cub petting and the private possession where they dump these animals when they can't use them any longer, then that's the first step to saving them in the wild. Is there you know, what's the status of any regulatory or, or legislation maybe on the federal level towards towards that aim? Is that in conversation? <laughs> yeah, and has been for a long time. So back in the, gosh, probably 98 or 99, Tippi Hedren, who runs a sanctuary out in California called Shambhala, had worked to have a bill introduced that would ban the private possession of big cats that would do away with a lot of the abuses that we saw in the industry. And it's our session, our, our uh, federal session is two years for each Congress. So it takes a bill it, within two years. If you don't get it passed into law, then it dies and you have to start over. So we started in 98 trying to get this bill passed and it was 2003 before it finally did and it was called the Captive Wildlife Safety Act. Whenever you pass a bill through Congress, you have to make a lot of concessions. So we had to drop the cub petting from it. We had to drop the banning of private ownership. But what the bill did was it made it illegal to sell a big cat across state lines as a pet. And even though there were a lot of parameters in that, what we saw was in 2003, I had to turn away 312 big cats that in addition to the ones that we rescued, and all of the sanctuaries were full. And so 
every other year that number was doubling. And when that bill passed in 2003, all of a sudden that number dropped from 312 to like 160 something. And as other states have finally come on and passed bans and partial bans, then those numbers have continued to drop. So what we've been trying to do ever since 2003, two years at a time, is to try and end the cub petting and end the private possession of big cats. And right now we are at the best position we've ever had. In December of last year, which was toward the end of the session, it ends December 31st, we passed the House with a two-thirds vote, which is the first time that we've ever been able to get a vote on the House floor and couldn't get it through the Senate in time. So we had to start all over again in January. But we currently have over 220 co-sponsors in the House and over 24 in the Senate. And I really believe that when the Senate is back in session, which comes, they come back in September, that we'll get a vote in the House again. We will pass that by a two thirds majority because we already did last year. And then we can move it over to the Senate. We still have a year and a half <laughs> to get it past the Senate instead of a few days. So I really think we will do it this year. And it only does two things. It stops the cub petting, makes that illegal for people to do it. And then people who have these animals can keep the ones they have. They just can't buy or breed more. Okay, I want to come back to the cub petting, but you said something a second ago about the 16 miles, I think it was, you said the bobcat traveled. So being around deer a lot, I've seen deer, and they're always moving uh, probably the same amount, if not more, but they're always eating, like eating nuts and berries and shrubs and food. Uh, when you, I think about a, a, a meat eater or a predator traveling that far, um, I think maybe like one meal a day, one meal every other day. What, what is it doing going so far? Um, is it just, does it take that long to find a prey? Is it looking toward a nest? Like that's a lot, that's a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, 16 miles, that's a long way to go. It's a lot of work. Huh? <laughs> lot of work. I wouldn't be walking 16 miles. I'm just saying I'd find my rat, two rats, whatever. And I'd go lay down. I, that's why I look this way, but I'm just saying. That's me. I mean, you know, a hundred square miles. I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible amount of territory. I think in addition to hunting, which of course is, you know, their primary goal is to survive. So they've got to be able to hunt enough to support themselves and to support kittens if they're raising kittens. So a mother has to do a whole lot more of that. But in addition to that, just watching big cats in captivity, what I've noticed is they walk around all the time. And for all of the cats that we have in cages, we can't, it's not legal to release a non-native cat. So Tigers that were born in this country are not native to this country. They can't be released here because they're not native. And I can't take them to India or Africa because they were born in the U.S. So it, it's illegal to release those guys. But I watch them walking for hours on end and they will just wander and wander and wander because they're so bored out of their freaking minds. And so I know whenever I'm bored or if I'm stressed, I walk and walk and walk and I can walk for four hours straight just by, you know, <laughs> walking that off. And so I can really understand why cats do it. Okay. And so you answered part of my question uh, with that. So um, you mentioned that most of the big cats are bred to be pet um, for this certain age group. And after that, they, they really have no use. Uh, I was going to ask you, why can't you use them to be pet pet? Uh, what their term was to be petted on and then shipped to Africa or to India, or maybe they have a deficit in uh, tigers or whatnot. That would seem to be a, a good free market way, if you will, to kind of resupply the, the, the de depleting population overseas. But why, why is that illegal? Because to me, that seems like that would be a good avenue. If the legislation would to push that, like you could raise them for petting, but then you had to export them. Would you be in favor of that? Well, it would never work if they were raised for petting. And the reason is in order to raise them for petting, you have to do like they did in Tiger King, where you saw that mother was giving birth and they were pulling the baby away from her as soon as it was born. They have to do that or the mother will raise them to be uh, like feral cats. And there's no way you could ever have your picture made with a feral cat that had been raised by his mother. And it doesn't matter how tame or uh, polite <laughs> that mother tiger might be, they will always raise their kittens to defend themselves and to stay away from people because they know inherently that that's what they're supposed to do. So any cat who is raised by humans and imprints on humans to see them as a source of food, if you release that animal back into the wild, or not back into the wild because it didn't come from the wild, but if you were to re release it into the wild, it has a number of things going against it. One is it takes the mother anywhere from a year and a half to three years to teach her cubs how to hunt and how to survive in the wild, how to stay away from people. 
And two, if they have been raised around people, they will go around people and that will get them in trouble with villages. There's a very famous video people see of Christian the lion. And so these guys in the UK had him as a pet and then they took him to Africa, they turned him loose and they came back a year later and the cat runs up and hugs him. Well, what they don't tell you is that very shortly after that, that cat was killed for killing livestock in a village because it had no fear of humans. And it causes, um, it causes danger to the other cats in that area because if, a, if you have a cow and that is your only source of food for your family, the only source of milk for your family, and some animal kills it in the night, you're going to kill the first lion you see the next day. It may not be the right lion, the lion who was raised by people and hanging out around people. It could have been some other lion that has now gotten in trouble and ended up being killed and being lost from that um, from that chain of that bloodline. And the bloodlines are another really important part of cats in the wild. Those cats who have been born in the wild and have survived to live long enough to be able to reproduce, they have been self-selected as being the fittest, the smartest. And you look at the ones that are bred in captivity, they're bred for exactly the opposite. We want animals who are dull and who will just sit there and let you pet them and pose with them instead of being who they really are. And people love to see things that are different. So they'll pay more for a white tiger. And the only way you get white tigers is through inbreeding, brother to sister and father to daughter. And they love to see things like likers, where it's a cross between a lion and a tiger. And so it's not even a, a species anymore that could go back to anywhere in the wild. And all of these cats that are in these facilities that allow the cub petting, they're all these nasty little roadside zoos. They're not your big zoos that are allowing that. And they're not tracking the pedigrees of these animals. So these cats have regional instincts. And there's an interesting thing about ocelots, if you want me to talk about that, as far as how they discovered this. But there are instincts that are native that have come through generation after generation of these animals that they know a certain area. Well, these cats that are in private hands aren't tracked that way because the zoos don't want anybody to know what the pedigree was on that animal because they don't want it tracing back to them that they were the ones that gave them over to these private zoos. And so the private zoos are mixing species, they're mixing bloodlines, they're polluting the gene pool, they're introducing these traits that would not survive in the wild. And so there's just no way that that would ever work. And it's not the problem. The problem is not that these cats don't breed. They're cats. They freaking breed like cats in the wild. The problem is protecting their habitat for them. And we can't get people to protect habitat where these animals live as long as they can go and pet a cub in captivity or see it up close. Okay, I won't bend to hop back in here to this one, but real quick, maybe maybe break down for us. You're, you're saying private zoo, and then we think of the public zoo. Um, when you say that term, I'm thinking Tiger King, like Joe Exotic private zoo. Is that the only? Is there only negative connotations around private zoos, or are there some good private zoos that do it well? Um, unpack what you what all when you say private zoo. What all is encompassed in that? You know, that was one of the big things that people didn't understand after watching Tiger King was the difference between zoos and sanctuaries. Zoos are in the business of buying and breeding and selling, and some of them allow public contact. The little roadside zoos do that. The big accredited zoos don't do that. And some of them will take the animals off site. So you do have both the big zoos, the accredited zoos, and the non-accredited zoos, the roadside zoos that will take animals out to fairs or rodeos or schools or late night TV shows. But then sanctuaries are the total opposite. They, they aren't allowed and we don't buy, breed, sell, allow public contact or take the animals off site for exhibit. So zoos and sanctuaries are totally different. But then within the zoo sanctuary, you have this huge array from people that have three tigers in their backyard and charge somebody to come over and pet them to you know, the big national zoos where they're accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and they don't let the people come in and pet them. So there's a, a wide difference in how zoos are regulated. And same thing with sanctuaries. I mean, even though a place may call itself a sanctuary, there are accredited sanctuaries like we are. And then they're just places who have tacked that onto their name and really aren't sanctuaries at all. Real quick for Ben Hobson here, you said they don't breed. 
Uh, are y'all sterilizing the animals? Or are you saying you don't encourage breeding? How does that work? We don't breed them at all. So Big Cat Rescue bred cats back in the 90s, back before the internet came along, back before we knew anything about how these cats aren't able to go back to the wild and how they don't serve any conservation values. So we stopped breeding in the 90s. But accredited sanctuaries are not allowed to buy, breed, sell, allow public contact, or take them off-site. And when I say not allowed to breed, you're not allowed to have accidental births either, which is what a lot of places claim. It's like, oh my gosh, we had another accident this year. Well, we'll just let you play with these cubs. But, you know, we, we're really against that. And then next year, look at this. We have new cubs again. I don't know how that happened. It's like, how are you people in charge of lions and tigers if you don't know how that started? I kind of have kind of a similar question to Ryan's, but... Um, you know, I think it was just a couple of years ago, there was a, a story that made national headlines. I believe it was in Ohio. There was, there was a break of uh, a number of different animals um, out, of, out of a gentleman's zoo. Um, um, there were lions and monkeys. And, uh, you know, so talk to me a little bit about um, the regulation of, around owning some of these animals as pets. Is it state by state? What, you know, how, how does that work? Uh, you know, can, can Ryan go like buy an ocelot? Or, you know, what's the, you know, what does that look like? It would be easier for Ryan to buy a tiger than an ocelot because he could buy a tiger right now probably for a hundred bucks. If it were already too big to be used for cub handling, he might even get it for free. An ocelot probably run you about $15,000 just because they're so rare. Uh, wow. But <laughs> that oh, big... real, real quick, that's an important thing you said there. Make sure I'm following. So we see these celebrities or you used to with big tigers and, and you always just, I always kind of assume that means wealth. You're saying like that's the cheap tigers to buy them is like so like Mike Tyson who had all these tigers he's picking them up for free or for a hundred bucks he wouldn't pay in tens of thousands of dollars correct? Well, I don't know what he paid well, I, because I, I, they probably saw him coming, but yeah, <laughs> he I, wouldn't I, have to because they give them away all the time. I, I, they don't want I, them wow. as soon as they're about sixteen weeks old. Wow. So yeah. it's really you know for all the people who think I got to have a tiger to show off my wealth, <laughs> no. <laughs> It's not a sign of wealth to anybody who knows anything about this industry. <laughs> but to answer your question, um, there are a patchwork of laws. And so there are four states that have no laws whatsoever. Nevada, Wisconsin, um, North Carolina, and I always forget. I think it's, I want to say Alabama. Um there's a map on our page if you go to bigcatrescue.org forward slash state laws exotic cats. And every state has a different set of laws. And so there's not two states in the entire country that have the same <laughs> laws, which is confusing for law enforcement. And for people who are trying to evade the laws, they can easily hop back and forth across states and do that. And so um, I lost my train of thought. It was something about state laws. Yeah, you're talking about evading, um, and you're going to the different states who have they have to have the laws. So, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, it, it's helped with the number of cats that have been bred and discarded as states have come on board with their bans and partial bans. And Ohio, Florida, and Texas have always been the three worst states in the country. Florida was worst, um, Ohio was next, and then Texas. But this incident that you mentioned in Ohio happened in 2011. The guy's name was Terry Thompson. He had been in jail on, um, I believe it was on trafficking in guns. And I think he was already a felon at the point that he did that. And so that's why he was in jail. But anyway, he gets out of jail, finds out his wife's been cheating on him, decides that he's just totally lost his mind over this, goes out into the yard, turns loose 56 lions, tigers, leopards, bears, wolves on the community. There's a storm rolling in. It's starting to get dark. And then he shoots himself in the head and commits suicide in the middle of that. And so the sheriff in town starts getting calls from people saying, I, I think a wolf was just like walking through my yard and I just saw a lion going after the neighbor's horse. And so the sheriff goes out there and it's starting to get dark. There's no way that you can um, sedate big cats when they are like full of adrenaline in a moment like that where they're free finally for the first time in their lives and they're just going nuts out there 
And so he had to give the orders to shoot every single animal. And they killed all but six of the animals. Six of them they were able to actually trap back into their cages and they went to the zoo. But what's, what's so important about this is we had been working. My Alexa's going nuts for some reason. Stop. <laughs> um, we had been working for so long with the Humane Society of the United States and other big animal organizations to try and get a federal bill passed in Ohio that would ban these kinds of backyard menageries. And the law had finally made it all the way through their Congress, their state Congress, and the governor was refusing to sign it because Jack Hanna came to him and didn't want him to sign this bill into law. And so as a result, this happens in 2011. And this is, there's a new film out called The Conservation Game. And it talks about how people like Jack Hanna and Boone Smith and the Irwins and all of these people that you see on these talk shows that are held out to be conservationists have been the ones that have been supporting this private trade in these animals because their big zoos don't have these animals for them to take on shows and then get rid of. And so what they've been doing is going to these backyard breeders, bringing in animals, sticking people in Columbus Zoo t-shirts or polos that are on stage to make it look like it's from the zoo. And even Jack Hanna and others, when asked, you know, where is this baby going to go when it's not here today? And, oh, it's going back to the wilds or it's going back to the Columbus Zoo or it's going to some wonderful sanctuary. And what the film exposes is that it was going to some horrible situation where it would then be pimped out at birthday parties and kept in wretched little tiny barren backyard cages that you wouldn't put a chicken in. And this film, I think, is going to really blow the lid off of all of what people have been seeing and believing on TV. But it started right there in in Ohio, where we had to fight Jack Hanna as being the main opponent for that bill and for our federal bill, because he had so much celebrity power. And unfortunately, law, uh, not law, but um, members of Congress are often swayed by that celebrity status. So uh, I'm curious, you mentioned three states, Florida, Texas, and Ohio. Uh, Florida and Texas, I can see their border states. They're surrounded by water. A lot of people coming in and out. Ohio is kind of random. Like, what about Ohio made it the toughest? Because it doesn't really seem to have something in co the same commonalities that Florida and Texas do. You know, that's an interesting question. Nobody's ever asked me that because I've always thought Florida and Texas probably had such a problem because we have such nice weather most of the year. And that means people can breed these cats year round and exploit them year round. Whereas in colder states, that's not possible. But Ohio gets pretty freaking cold. And so the only thing I can see that would have made Ohio such a hotbed would have been the Columbus Zoo and the influence of Jack Hanna in that area. Um, it was a big place for auctions for these animals. And so I think it was just part of their culture to exploit animals this way is probably what put them in that top three. And when I s say top three, that's based on the numbers of killings, maulings, and escapes by big cats, because I've tracked that since the 90s, and that's where those three states came up so high. Yeah, and so let's talk about, kind of go back to the myth versus perception. Um, in a perfect world, if it's Carol Baskin, is she advocating that all the big tigers are safely and humanely um, leave the United States of America, go live in somewhere like Africa or India where they have, you know, billions of acres of roam? Or do you think that they can coexist in a country like ours because we have so much space? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I do understand the sympathetic to the argument um, that people are concerned about being around big cats. Um, and it seems like what you're saying is that here we're breeding them for a very small window and then we're stuck with them. Uh, and then when we're stuck with them, that creates problems. So, in a perfect world, if we could start over tomorrow and there were no tigers in the U.S. or big cats in the U.S., would you still bring them here? Um, what would you do? Well, I think in a perfect world, and first off, none of the animals who are in the U.S. can go back to the states or the countries where they are considered native to because they were born here in the U.S. So that's not going to happen. And all of the cats who are currently in cages, sadly, will die in cages. But after that, there doesn't need to be new generations of cats in cages. And I want to show you 
show you that right here on my desk, because I'm involved in it every day, is what I think is the future for big cats. Are you guys gamers? Do you? Yeah, I am. So, I'm being, but I am. So you know what it's like to put on that headset and be totally immersed in some other world. And that's the future that we can all work on right now for these cats. The cats who are in cages will be there until they die, which in most cases is only going to be another five, maybe 10 years at the most. They live it to into their 20s here at Big Cat Rescue, but almost no, nowhere else do they live that long. It's really rare when a cat lives past 15 anywhere else. So this problem can go away, but it's only going to go away if we figure out a way of preserving these animals in such a way that everybody gets to enjoy them. So my picture, my vision of the future is something that we're already working on. We already every week put out a new immersive video so that when you put that headset on, you are in the enclosure with the cat. You are seeing right inside that cat's mouth while she's chewing her bones and um, meat up, or you're playing with the ball as she's playing with the ball. And you're seeing this very close as a way of trying to get people to prefer that kind of experience to going to a zoo and seeing an animal languishing in a cage. And so if we can get people to want more and more of that, then I'm working with a company right now called Iconic Engine that makes 360 degree internet streaming cameras. Now imagine putting those cameras in the wild where these cats live and putting them along the paths that the cats are known to travel because they do tend to travel the same places. They go to the same watering holes. They have the same den sites, all of those kinds of things. You have these cameras all over the area and they're generating a signal out to the ether every second of what's going on in that entire ecosystem. And you attach that feed, that video feed to a smart chain contract like blockchain. And you set it so that maybe 90% of the money for those feeds, like you would pay a subscription like you would to Hulu to be able to see these feeds all around the world. And 90% of your subscription through those smart contracts goes back to whatever, wherever that camera is sitting, it goes back to their local economies to give them a reason to want to protect those habitats and protect those animals rather than cutting down the forest and selling the wood or cutting down the forest in order to have, you know, a few years of being able to farm on that land before they completely use up the soil and then having to do it again and again. And then the other 10% may go back to the zoos and the zoos would be there for people who can't afford a $500 headset. So you take your family down to the zoo, you use their equipment, you're sitting there in their building, you decide you wanna to go to the Himalayas and see snow leopards up in the Himalayas. And so they're blowing cold air on you and you're smelling the, the uh, yak stew or whatever the monks are cooking in the tent next door. And you're having this total immersive experience in what it's like to be a snow leopard and every other animal in that animal's world. And that is education. That is teaching your children what it means to be an animal in the fabric of life. That That is so much better than the message we're currently teaching children, which is that it's okay to take away the freedom of some other if that amuses you. That is the absolute worst thing we could possibly be teaching our children. No wonder we're in the mess we're in that for the last 200 years, that's been the message. We can do whatever we want because we can. We got we have got to stop that now. Yeah, you know, it's been, um, you know, I, I was born into a family that we, I, I love nature, lo love being out in the mountains, have, have a, a love of animals, as, you know, that comes along with that as well. And so, you know, it's always sort of been, I use that word fr fascinating, fascinating is not the right word, but fascinating to watch, you know, uh, uh, Blackfish came out a number of years ago and was talking about the captivity of, of, uh, of killer whales. And, and uh, you know, there have been a number of documentaries sort of painting the, the ugly side of animal commercialization or, or animal tourism, or however you, you want to coin it. I'm curious what what you think really is going to be the difference maker to, to sort of wake people up to, because, you know, against, I think what you just talked about is really interesting. And I love that idea. Uh, and I love, you know, I love that concept. But there's something to kind of the experiential of, of tactile feel. 
and, and there's something kind of irreplaceable to that. And I'm curious to your opinion, you know, yeah, how, how, how can you, how can we sort of re-educate the, the public on the, the benefits of tiger, you know, big cats in, in the ecosystem, but, but not having as much of a touch and feel because I mean, you know, looking at, to your point, I mean, you know, whenever you go to the zoo and you see the tiger, you know, pacing back and forth, that's clearly, I mean, there, there's no, neither side is benefiting from that. I mean, I'm not benefiting from seeing that. That's not really educating, you know, to your point, educating me on anything about the, the cat and the cat clearly you know, has to be miserable. Well, you guys certainly know about haptic gloves and all of the things that are coming out in haptics with gaming. And for people, and one of the things I've noticed, whenever we take our headsets out before COVID, we used to go set up in you know, convention centers and stuff and put headsets on people for the first time. And they would see the tiger you know, coming, running at them. And the first thing they want to do is reach out and pet it, which is just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> because I work with tigers, I would never reach out to touch a tiger. <laughs> but most people want to touch it. They want to feel that. And I think you could do that with haptic gloves in a way that's not harming the cat and is giving you that same experience that people seem to have a bizarre desire to do. But for all of the people who say that breeding these cubs and letting people touch them is what makes them care about conservation and saving cats in the wild, that's just a lie. There's no evidence whatsoever that touching a baby tiger has ever made anybody save them in the wild. And in the few studies that they have done, they've been done with chimps, they've proven that exactly the opposite is true. People feel like if I'm allowed to touch this endangered species, then it must not be that that endangered or they wouldn't let me do it. And so they don't have as much concern for protecting that animal. So touching them, even though it's something people want to do, it's not something anybody is entitled to do and it's not helping any of us if we allow them to do it. So I think we need to just take that off the table other than haptic gloves. So you mentioned the last 200 years and, and I had a thought when you're talking about all this, um, uh, you mentioned kind of the, the camera stuff and Ben and I have some business interest in that. So it's kind of interesting to hear all this come together. Um, you know, I, I like to relate where we're at in 2021 to like 1950, 1960, not necessarily from a political standpoint, but from a technology standpoint, right? Or World War II. Um, so right now, you know, you're in Florida, we're in Texas, Ben and I are in two different cities in Texas, and we're talking right here. We're going to download this, upload it. Anyone in the world can watch this. In 1950, 1850, 1750, that just wasn't possible. Um, so the way that we've handled some of this animal stuff historically was maybe a necessity. Now, I'm not saying all the motivations were pure or impure, but some of it, we just didn't have the technology to monitor the great white shark or the tiger or whatever. Now that we're in the age of technology where we can monitor these animals, um, like I like watching the bald eagle's nest, you know, you watch the babies uh, be born and stuff. Now that we can do all that. I wonder if it will change the way that we move forward because we don't necessarily have to monitor them in captivity. We can actually monitor them in the wild. Do you, have you seen maybe, um, so you have kind of the experiential side that you talked about, but now that you can actually monitor them without touching them per se, um, from a scientific standpoint, has that changed how the, the scientific community has thought about these animals? It's changed an awful lot. When you talk about these remote cameras, like the on the bird's nests and such, we are part of explore.org's network of cameras. And they have cameras all around the world that are watching all kinds of things. You can be underwater watching sharks and orcas in the wild, and you can be in a bird's nest, and you can be uh, at Big Cat Rescue watching our cats run around vacation rotation or swimming in Tiger Lake. And as a result of people being able to see who these animals really are in their, well, here at Big Cat Rescue, it's not totally natural because they're in cages. But what's been interesting to me is that people watch our cats 24 seven and they notice that the cats are awake all night and they sleep all day. And then they think about, well, when I go to the zoo, I go during the day and these cats are sleeping all day. So at night, the zoos lock, the bigger zoos, lock the animals up in what they call night houses at night. And those night houses are usually about anywhere from 10 to 10 feet wide to about 16 feet deep. And they typically don't have any windows. They are in these jail cells for the period of time when they are the most active at Big Cat Rescue. They're climbing trees and swimming around in the lake and chasing all kinds of snakes and lizards and whatever through the grass. And that's at a time 
when the zoos are closed, so they don't want the exposure to somebody coming in there and getting hurt or maybe a cat getting loose. And so they lock them up during the most active time of their life. And people are starting to say, I don't want to see that happen at the zoo. I, I don't think that's fair to those animals. And the other benefit of having these cameras in the wild, because a lot of times we release bobcats and we have to release them into huge uh, tracts of land here. If they were born in Florida, we can do that. And so we set up cameras and what we find is we catch poachers. <laughs> we catch all kinds of other animals on those cameras. And we have learned so much more about these animals by virtue of being able to spy on them without intruding into their lives. So when I said 200 years, we've had this bad message of zoos. It's been because that's zoos have been popular for the last 200 years. Yeah. And I think there may have been something to learn in the beginning when they were gathering animals and trying to learn about them and where they lived. But I think the technology has been here for at least the last decade that we need to move beyond that. And I think the only reason that we hang on to the old way of doing things is because we haven't been forced to move into a better way of doing things right. until COVID came along. And then all of a sudden, the it, we all got a kick in the pants to start <laughs> changing the way we do things. Right. Okay. So you mentioned COVID. We touched on Tiger King. I do want to talk about that for a, little, a few minutes here. Um, and it's funny because I just saw this meme. I'm trying to see. I posted it on Instagram four days ago. And it's Dr. Evil on the top and it's number two on the bottom. And Dr. Evil says the Delta variant isn't working. And number two says release the milk crates. I don't know if you see those milk crate challenge videos. Um, but that is the same meme that put me on to Tiger King. It was Dr. Evil talking about COVID. Um, I don't remember what it was. And then she was yelling, release the Tiger King video. And I was like, what is the Tiger King video? And so that's what got me. What was it like last year? So I don't want to give my sob story of what COVID was like, but what was it like for you to go from like, we're all locked down. And then Carol Basket is now a national global sensational celebrity overnight. Did you expect that to happen? Were there a lot of promos? Because I just kind of caught it on the internet like everyone else. I said everyone else. I don't know. It was, it was kind of weird for me. What was it like for you to experience that? We were told during the five-year period that we were working with the producers that what they were working on was the blackfish for big cats. And so that's why we were happy to have them into the sanctuary anytime they liked over that five-year period. We'd spend days on end filming with them and introducing them to experts in the field hoping that they would do the same thing Blackfish did. And they said that they were going to show all these abusive things that were happening to animals. And then they were going to interview all of these experts about why this was bad and why this was causing the extinction of these animals rather than saving them, like the people in Tiger King were saying that they were breeding for conservation and all that crap. And they actually showed us a, uh, a trailer and a sizzle reel and they tried to sell it to CNN as Stolen World was the name of it. I thought it was Stolen Wildlife, but my husband said it was Stolen World. And CNN didn't buy it. And so I think at some point they came along and said, okay, well, if we're ever gonna sell this, we have to make it something that people will watch. And they just threw out everything that was important and decided to focus on just the craziness that you guys saw in Tiger King. And that came at a time when as you mentioned, it was a perfect storm. Everybody on March 15th of 2020, we closed our gates due to COVID because we couldn't give tours with people being close together on our tours. And then five days later, Tiger King came out and <laughs> we were not at all. We had no idea it was going to be what it was or even called what it was. And we saw the trailers or not the trailers, but the um, advertisements for it on Netflix we contacted the producers and we were like, who's working on that show? What is that about? <laughs> because it didn't look anything like what we had been shown or what we had been working on. And so we were just <laughs> gobsmacked that that was what they ended up producing after all of the opportunities that they had. So we sat down and we binge watched it like everybody else did. And what my husband and I said to each other at the end of that was, well, that was a missed opportunity because it came away not showing people that there is some action they can take. They can actually prohibit cub petting and phase out private ownership in order to stop all of that abuse. There was no mention of being able to do that in that show. And it left everybody feeling like this is just a horrible situation that there's, you know, they ended it by saying, 
the bill hasn't passed and there's all these animals in captivity and it's just doom and gloom. And it's like, no, this is when you rally everybody to go out there and talk to their member of Congress and ask them to support the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And and they just didn't. And so I, I really hated that. As far as the publicity of it, I, I guess I'm glad that it happened during COVID because everybody was wearing masks. Nobody was going anywhere. We weren't having any guests. So except for the people that stopped me as I tried to ride my backpack and forth to work, I didn't run into a whole lot of that celebrityness. And then it wasn't until I went out to LA for Dancing with the Stars and I got off the plane there and people knew who I was that I was like, well, that's weird because everybody here in Tampa knows who I am. But it was, yeah, I, I didn't expect that. Yeah, so I was curious um, you know, from that perspective. You, you mentioned that the publicity, or, or you, uh, as you said, I think, you're, and I think you put it well, that it was a missed opportunity. You know, the show itself. But have you been able to sort of wrangle the momentum that came from that, good or bad, and be able to you know find new partners, find maybe new funds, and, and, and has there been sort of a invigoration of new attention towards this issue since the show? It hasn't seen? been. Well, I don't think it's been the result of the show so much as trying to um, capitalize on the media frenzy around it. So when I did Dancing with the Stars, part of the reason that I did that was we were losing a million dollars a year in revenue by not being able to do tours at the sanctuary. And that was a way to augment that um, loss of income. And I started doing cameos as a way of augmenting that income so that we could continue to fund the lobbying and the legislation that we've been working on, because I was afraid that the donations to the sanctuary were not even going to be enough to take care of the cats, much less to take care of all of the stuff that we have to do legislatively, because you can only spend like 5% of mm -hmm. your income on that sort of thing. So that's why I started doing Dancing with the Stars and these other things. What it was Dancing with the Stars that gave me access to the media. And part of what I had negotiated with them was that in those little packages where they talk about each one of the dancers, that they would talk about the issues. But in addition to that, they would also allow me to have just free reign with their media. And I mean, every day it was like paparazzi day at the dance hall because they would just line up on the streets for any shots they could get of celebrities coming or going. So I got an opportunity there to talk about the cat issues. And then they would line up radio tours and print tours and magazine tours and video tours where they'd have like 10 different um, channels or outlets in a row that I would talk to for like five or 10 minutes each. And I got to talk about the big cat issues and about the big cat public safety act. So by doing that is what gave me the opportunity to get this message into the public realm. It was not because Tiger King gave me that. It was because Dancing with the Stars gave it to me. But clearly, they only did it because of the fact that I've been in Tiger King. So one of the uh, eye awakening moments for me was after you did the show, you went on Clay Travis's show. I don't remember that or not. He had you on his show. It's a sports talk radio show. And I heard you and I was like, wait, wait, this is person is completely different than what I saw on Tiger King. Like, and I heard you talk about kind of, and it's been a while now since you did the show, but it's, I heard you talk about just kind of how you were, you felt like they misrepresented um, your position. And I think you said they were only there for like a day or something like that. Maybe unpack for those who aren't aware um, kind of how you feel Tiger King dramatized some of the things <laughs> around Carol Baskin. Yeah. You know, I, I had never, we had worked with so many different filmmakers over the years. And during that same five year period that we were working with them, we were working with Mike Weber, who did the conservation game film that just came out and won the social justice award at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. We were working with another uh, fellow, Michael Samstag, who was doing a film called Hidden Tiger. And we had a friend, Carl Amon, who I had actually judged his film at the Jackson Hole Wildlife uh, Film Festival called Tiger Mafia. And it aired today for a limited showing, an online showing. And people were just, it was wonderful sitting there in the audience and hearing so many people being so angry. And they're like, why doesn't everybody know this? Why don't they know what's happening to these tigers? And it's the exact same thing that happened with CNN. The networks and the studios, they don't want the truth because the truth is so ugly and dark and makes us should make us all feel wretched for our part in it and our failure to care about it. 
and they want character driven dumpster fires, you know, Tiger King was a huge success. And I think they want more of that kind of programming than the real type of programming that they could get through really addressing these issues. Now I've gotten myself off on a tangent. Um, your question was, I was, yeah, oh, yeah. how it was different. So about, about how you were portrayed versus how you thought maybe you're going to be portrayed. Um, I think you mentioned that you were, that they only filmed you like you're all in the same clothes and it's all one day shot or something like that. I, I can't remember all the details, but I remember, I remember you unpacking it. I was like, oh, wow. You pointed out a lot of things about uh, how they represented you on the show, which I found quite fascinating. There was so much of that in the film that I actually did an entire page at bigcatrescue.org slash Netflix that would show you here at minute number three minutes and 45 seconds, you were seeing this on the screen and yet this was the truth. This is what I had told them or this was the evidence that I gave them or this was the, you know, whatever behind the scenes that um, was in total contradiction to what people were being shown. And so there's a, I didn't know this because I don't know anything about films, but there's a element that they call show don't tell. And so even though they were letting me talk about some of the issues throughout Tiger King, what they were showing on the screen was such that it was totally distracting the person from anything that I was saying, or they would let me say that you know, breeding these cats does nothing for conservation. And then they'd line up five of these guys that pimp out cubs saying, oh yeah, you got to make people care about animals by petting them. So they would, you know, completely castrate anything that I said by then lining up all of these tiger pimps as their, their, uh, wit their credible <laughs> witnesses. Yeah. And so the other thing that I think people would be surprised about as far as the filming goes, and this was where it was different filming with them than with, with all of these other filmmakers. Eric Good is not a filmmaker. He's a, a restaurateur. Uh, he owns a lot of properties in New York City and has a ton of money and decided he wanted to make this film. And so his way of doing an interview would be to ask me a question. And then if he didn't like the answer, he would ask me that same question over and over and over in every different way you can imagine. And he, you know, when I'd question him about, well, you just asked me this, I just gave you the answer. Why, you know, and he was like, well, there was a plane going over or your, your inflection wasn't quite uh, strong enough, or it seems like, you know, um, it, it just all of these excuses for doing it. And then when I saw the finished film, it was like, well, this is why he did it. Cause he needed little sound bites that he could piece together to make it look like I'm saying one thing and I'm totally talking about something else. And so you'll see segments where it looks like we've gone straight from this to this, but I've gained 20 pounds between those two shots. My hair has grown six inches between those two shots and it's a different color and I'm wearing different clothes. And it's like, this did not happen back to back. <laughs> but if you can make it fast enough, cause most, if you look at almost any film, there's hardly more than two seconds that the camera is on something before it cuts to another, cuts to another, cuts to another. And unless you're looking for that, you would never see that so much of it was like that. And then I've heard since, you know, in the last year and a half, so many of the people that were in Tiger King said the same thing had been done to them. Yeah, that, that was interesting because in the documentary or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, we do have one of Joe, Joe's guys commit suicide right there on the camera is very, very disturbing thing to watch. Very little time is kind of spent around that. They do kind of talk about his manipulation, but it seems like they spent far more, I don't I didn't count the minutes, they spent far more time on your first husband than him. Like, and I was like, well, here is someone who the camera, best I can tell, shot, caught, caught shooting himself. And it was in front of him. What was that like? Where, where, does that make you angry to say, hey, they're going to accuse me of all this stuff, but Joe's obviously ruining people's lives and they're ignoring this altogether? I did find it just bizarre that you would take all of these people who were being so wretched to animals and to each other yeah. and position them as being folk heroes or victims. You know, like I was this vicious villain who was taking away their livelihood and telling them they can't play with tigers anymore. And it's like, I have what power do I have? The only power I have is to expose the abuse and let people decide what they're going to do. 
And that's why they all hate me is because I expose the abuse and let people decide what they're going to do. And they don't want anybody calling attention to those things. And yet that was not at all the way Tiger King portrayed me. It, it instead made it look like I was just um, like it was personal for me. And it's never been personal for me. I've never gone after what any of these people have said or done or any of their personal behaviors or attributes or anything. For me, it's always been about ending the abuse of the cats and trying to keep it focused on that. Okay. Uh, ben, I got one more question. Do you have one more before I get to my last question? Why don't you go and, and I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask one after. Okay. So, no, no, no. You go ahead and go. I, 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 mine, mine has to be the last one. It's a, it's a, it's a special listener request. So you go ahead and go. Oh, we're, or we're taking listener request questions. I like that. Um, so I guess, uh, Carol, last question that I have um, is, so I think I saw recently that there was a judgment finally that uh, the, uh, the, the zoo, if I'm using that terminology correctly, uh, that, that was owned by the low, uh, by Jeff is uh, now under your ownership. Is, and if, am I right about that? And, and sort of what is being done at current um, with some of the sort of the legacy from Tiger King and, and those cats. Um, you know, I know that you said you're out in, in Tampa, um, but if I'm correct, that, the, um, that that zoo is in Oklahoma, correct? Yes. We had to sue Joe Exotic in 2012 because he was using the name Big Cat, Big Cat Rescue Entertainment. And that was just way too close to our trademark name of Big Cat Rescue. And people thought that it was us at the malls that were doing the cub petting and such. So we filed a suit thinking he would just stop using the name and quit. And instead, he just decided to drag this out all these years. And that's, you know, that's why we stayed in court. He kept saying we were the ones dragging it out, but it wasn't. It was him. And so we finally got a judgment against him just recently. I mean, we've gotten judgments over the years. We got a million dollar judgment against him in 2013 or 2014, I think. And then we had worked out a deal where he could pay us back modest amounts in order to pay the judgment off over. He'd never paid off in his whole lifetime, but we had worked that out with him with the agreement that he stopped the cup petting. And then Jeff Lowe came in and said, no, we're going to keep fighting this and tore up the agreement. So we weren't able to um, end our, our battle with Joe. And so when Joe went to jail in 2018, Jeff Lowe took over the GW Zoo, which was in Winniewood, Oklahoma. And it wasn't until June, well, maybe April of 2021 that we were awarded possession of the zoo in Winniewood. And the judge gave Jeff Lowe something like 120 days to move out. And Jeff Lowe was already in the process of moving all of the cats an hour south to Thackerville, Oklahoma, at a new facility that he got a donor to put up the money for. So he was moving all the cats down there. And on October, I guess this was in 2020, because in October 3rd of 2020 is when he had to be off the property. We took possession of the GW Zoo and it was wretched. He had just, there was like, it looked like a chicken truck had exploded. There was dead carcasses everywhere throughout that entire place. The flies in there were so thick that all of the neighbors were losing their minds because they have horse farms there and they were just inundated with the flies from all of this rotting meat and rotting carcasses. And so we went in there, spent like $20,000 cleaning up that mess and put the, pro put the property on the market for sale with the agreement that it have a rider in the deed that it could never again be used for housing wild animals or anything related to Tiger King or Joe Exotic or anything else couldn't be used in the name of whatever they did there. And so we finally sold it in June. And I had no idea that that was such a big deal because nobody covered it at the time that we sold it in June. And they just recently, mm -hmm. PMC found, it, found out about it while I was in LA last week and 30 different media outlets jumped on it. It was like, oh my gosh, they sold the zoo. And it was like, yeah, we sold the zoo months ago. <laughs> but um, I'm really glad to be rid of it because there was a lot more cleanup that needed to be done that I did not want to have to do. And the people who bought it are kind of in that business of going into properties that need a lot of work and fixing them up. So I think I think they got what they wanted. I got out of there, which is what I wanted. And I made sure that there's not going to be any more exotic cats or animals of any kind kept there. Okay. So the, the listener question I got was, uh, I got a bunch, but the, but the one the one was, will Carol Baskin say, hey, all you cool cats and kittens, you're listening to Inside the War Room. 
So, Carol, I've got to put you on the spot. I will put you, if you, if you would grace us with that, I will put you on the big screen here. I'll kick Ben out. I'll get out. If not, that's fine too. But I did get asked. Yeah, that. do. Okay, hold on. So let, me, let, me get, uh, let me uh put you on the big screen here. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's Carol Baskin from Big Cat Rescue, and you are listening to Inside the War Room. That 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 was fantastic. I'm retiring from podcasting. It's over. I'm done. That was the greatest. Drop, the that's a drop. Life that's life. a drop the mic moment. That was fantastic. <laughs> I forgot my name the first time. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> bigcatrescue.org is the website. We'll link to that in the show notes. Carol, is there anywhere else you want to send folks to? Yes. If if you have a U.S. audience, sending them to bigcatact.com is where they can actually take action to protect these cats. Okay, I will email you about that when we get off to make sure I get that right. But okay, we'll make sure we include that in the show notes as well. Carol, you have been fantastic. You were, uh, just for everyone, I always try to give people um, a little bit of insight here. So you, I emailed you within an hour. You're like, hey, I went and listened to a podcast. I wanted to come on and all this. You've been very quick to respond to everything. You are a uh, very gracious person with your time. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this podcast. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate the time, Carol. Thank you.